Good morning. Thanks so much again for your generous offer to, for me to be with you this week. It's fun. On Tuesday, we looked together at what is increasingly testified to in our culture. We looked at people who say they have encounters with God through the arts, particularly film. Yesterday, I looked at scripture using the testimonies about God's presence in the movies as a pair of spectacles to look at again at a series of biblical texts. Uh, today, well, uh, my conclusion yesterday was that the Bible has multiple biblical texts, many often stories which focus on God's revealing presence in all of life, in our dreams, in nature's pregnant silences, even in the lives of religious leaders of other religions. This more general revelation, for that's what it is, is not salvific. Hear me well. It doesn't substitute for God's saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. But it's also not without value either. Surely it's more than just a trace or an echo. What those prisoners heard that morning was transformative in their lives as we heard the conversation you remember at the lunch table that followed. Just ask Abimelech or Melchizedek, ask Balaam or Elijah, ask Augur or Necho, ask Damaris or the people of Lystra. So Bible experience, today I want to turn to church tradition to church history, to the thousand-year practice of scripture reading, and ask of our medieval Christian predecessors how we might have a thick reading or a thick experience with a text or a movie or another cultural or human artifact. How is it that we really experience God through a film or a song? or a book. In particular, could the practice of Bible reading, we could say, could the practice of interpreting special revelation, a practice that went on in the church for a millennium, give us a paradigm for interpreting that broader revelation when we read a work of art? or a sunset. Here's something that Dante considered. It's something that Flannery O'Connor believed in. I really haven't found anybody else that's gone that direction that we're going to go this morning. But I think it can be productive. My, my question for us this morning is, could our pre-modern method of thick interpretation, thick readings of the biblical story help us understand our postmodern experiences of both creation and human creativity. In particular, could the fourfold method of biblical interpretation and its cousin, Lectio Divina, provide clues that might help us understand how we can unpack a piece of art. So we saw a clip from Shawshank Redemption. In the first decade of scholarship on Christianity in film, <clears throat> the focus tended to be more didactic. It was on comparing movie themes with Bible themes. So Shawshank was considered a movie about hope and thousands of sermons used the movie to illustrate 
a theology of hope. But is that really what the movie is? Is, is the movie about hope or does the movie instill hope? Do you hear the difference? Does it give us information about hope, or does it inspire hope? It was the latter that moved the movie to the top of the IMDb chart. People who see the movie often sense their spirits being stretched. Usually that scene, or what's the other one that people reference? When you saw the movie, those two scenes that provided some possibility within you for experience and that hope was this one and when they were drinking beer on the roof right when those guys could finally be human just once take the movie field of dreams when we interviewed the director and screenwriter phil alden robinson he said that he had no explicit spiritual intention for the movie. I really find that difficult to believe. Um, I think what he meant is he had no explicitly religious, and he was thinking of a particular sort of religious category, intention. But he said he recognized that the movie had spiritually affected thousands of people over the years. We interviewed him about 10 years after the movie had come out, and he said he had received over 10,000 letters from men and women who had written him saying because of the movie, they'd been compelled to reach out to their fathers and seek reconciliation, or to their sons and play catch because they hadn't done it when they were a kid. Movies, like all of our cultural stories, offer a way of exploring life's larger riddles, testing out possible solutions. And in the process, they provide opportunities to be transformative, to, to speak into our spirits, to even on occasion evoke the spirit. Uh, when, when you saw and it's a tough movie, but I hope you saw it. When you, when you saw the movie 12 Years a Slave, for instance, it's a very tough movie. It isn't just data that we receive about the inhumanity of slavery. Rather, the, the movie affects us as whole people. It challenges us, us to act differently towards people, all people, as we're ushered into Solomon Northrup's reality. And like all great art, it even invites wonder for some. Could I have been Solomon? How could he have done that? The movie, like all great art, requires of us a thick viewing, one that invites participation and response. But what exactly does that mean? Let me see if I can move through this. Basil Pennington, the Cistercian monk, whose book Centering Prayer has sold over a million copies, describes how Christians for a thousand years practiced the presence of God in the reading of Scripture. When asked to describe his method, he uses the term lectio because he says that's the Latin for what's the English translation is reading, but he says reading is too reductive a word. You know, you can read something for one of my classes and not know what you read, a half an hour later. You, you can read something and leave it out there. But he says, when you say to another person, I read you, 
What does that mean? That means I get you. That means un- behind those words you're saying, I-, I understand the rest of the story. He said, that's what Lectio means. It's more than just I get the content. It means I fully get you with the layers of meaning you intend. And that's what he is after in helping us, in this case, to read scripture. Or again, if you go back and study, as probably you do in your history of biblical interpretation classes, that thick reading of scripture that's often known as the fourfold method of interpretation, those medieval exegetes did not have as their goal to know about God, but rather what? To know God. And they did that, they said, by reading the text literally. What did it mean? What did it say? But then they went on to interpret it spiritually, inviting readers to open it up allegorically in faith, so that that particular story became part of a larger story. And then tropologically, or morally, as the story invited action, participation, response. And finally, anagogically, as the reader had a transcendent vision or encounter that provided hope and perspective for life here and now. Now, that's all very abstract. Let me make it more concrete. We heard that wonderful poem, Drop a Mouse into a Poem. Couldn't be better. Let me suggest an alternative, not a mouse. Think for a minute about a poem about moldy magnolia leaves. Okay? A poem about moldy Magnolia leaves. Well, on the surface, it's a description about rotting leaves. That's where you begin. That's what it's saying. But if that's all it is, it's not a poem. Or at least not a very good poem. (laughs) Might be a science textbook, but it's not a poem. But if you get it, the poem also becomes a reflection on the transience of all life, the the preciousness of life that is also decaying. It's about my body that's decaying. decaying. It's about life's fragility. I begin to care about the interconnectedness of life. And I said, let the poem get under my skin as I really read it. I'm more apt next time to protect the life that I encounter. It's fragile. It's on the way to death. It might even become an ecological invitation. But, but the poem might even do more, right? The poem, grounded as it is in creation, might break the reader out to an experience of the creator. Here's what C.S. Lewis, in his Surprised by Joy, said about his experience when his mother read for him Beatrice Potter's Squirrel Nutkin. Or later when he read the Greek play Hippolytus. Or later when George MacDonald's book Fantastes was read. See, see, that poem about moldy magnolia leaves might actually cause someone to be surprised by joy. That, that's what it is to see or hear a poem or a song or a movie. So, so, so my thesis, and then we're going to illustrate it. My, my simple thesis this morning, 
as with Lectio, or as with the fourfold method of biblical interpretation, when movies are significant spiritually to viewers, it's because we've allowed them a thick viewing. We've not only entered into their story, as we say, I read you. If you saw 12 Years a Slave, you entered into Solomon's story. You were in his place, and it was horrible. We've allowed it to become personal. And that means it will encourage in us our practice to change, our action to change. It might even invite divine contemplation. So there's a thickness to the interpretation of art that's possible that I would say is even demanded. Movies, at least at their best, open viewers to an overflow of meaning. It stimulates faithful belief. It encourages right practice. It invites divine encounter. Okay, but all of that probably is still too abstract. Those are words out there. So let me ask the question, how might a small dark documentary, March of the Penguins, how many of you saw that documentary? Half of you maybe. Put it on your list, the rest of you, your Netflix list. It's a wonderful, right? It's a wonderful documentary. How might March of the Penguins filmed by the French, then rescripted for an American audience and narrated by Morgan Freeman, the voice of God. <laughs> How might that movie invite a thick description? Let's watch a little. The question I'm wanting to ask you is why after that movie came out in the summer, it created a phenomena across the US of love for penguins. <laughs> Such that the gap, January the next year, their marketing for Valentine's Day were boxer shorts covered with penguins. It's funny, but it's an actual good question to ask. What, what was it that got into our psyche because of that movie? On the literal level, it's a historical documentary that takes us on this incredible journey into a world that most of us will simply never see or experience. That's what movies can do the world of the emperor penguin in Antarctica. In that environment where the average temperature is minus 50, where gale force winds blow, it's only the emperor that survived for centuries. While the film is, is simply a visual feast, from that opening scenes of those ice flows to the textured close-ups of the penguins' coats. It's also a poignant story of their survival. We watch them walk single file or waddle single file from the sea to their mating area 70 miles away. And we find ourselves rooting for their success. But the movie is much more than that. More than simply 80 minutes of penguin sex. <laughs> for, for many viewers, it brings a heightened sensitivity to our own understanding of life. Not just the penguin's life. So when Morgan Freeman says, those penguins are sort of like us. We're already there with him. 
We're part of the family of life. But March of Penguins does even more than that. That movie came out around the same time as An Inconvenient Truth. You remember that movie? That actually was a great movie for, already, for people who were already convinced. It was a movie also that showed the ecological danger. But what was different about March of the Penguins is whether you were f for that ecological argument or suspicious of it, you loved those penguins and you wanted them to be protected. The, the movie had the effect to create in us an ethical concern for this planet. And for a few of us, the movie might also have been the occasion for an encounter with God. The summer that the movie came out, I was up in Vancouver teaching a class in theology and film at Regent College, great school. And one of the students, he hadn't seen enough movies, so he came up and he said, I would like to go out and see a movie with you and your wife and my wife, can we do that? And I said, fine. And the movie that we picked, <clears throat> he had not seen, we'd seen it, but we're happy to see it again, was March of the Penguins. Because the movie was going to be a late show, we said, well, let's get coffee first. So we got coffee and we listened to their story. This was his last course in seminary. He was about to go out into ministry and he said he had two choices. One of those was a church in downtown Vancouver, a church to 20, a ministry to 20 to 30 year olds who didn't like church. There, there are literally a hundreds of thousands in that downtown Vancouver area that fit that description. And the First Baptist there in that city was wanting to do that ministry, but they didn't have enough money, so it would be only a half-time salary. And he would need to have his wife, and she would need to say yes to continuing to work as an emergency or critical care nurse, and their little one-and-a-half-year-old would have to remain in daycare. Or he could go to Saskatchewan, where he was from, and become the assistant minister in a, a large Baptist church, be the youth pastor there, and that city he could afford to buy a house and his wife wouldn't have to work and she could stay home with her kid. And they didn't know what to do because the one seemed right but seemed impossible. The other seemed, okay. We said we'd pray for him. We went into the movie. We um, no longer thought about that and got captured by the film. It was midnight when the movie's over. We went home. I got there at 8 o'clock. Class was starting at 8.30. There at the door waiting for me was Santosh. He said to me, you know, on our way home, both my wife and I looked at each other and said almost simultaneously, we need to take the church in downtown Vancouver. And then they looked at each other again, and one of them said, if God can take care of those stupid penguins... <laughs> He can take care of us. Movies have the potential to take us deep. They invite thick spiritual readings by us and our friends. They provide us a greater understanding of life's adventure. They can give concrete advice, guidance as to appropriate action. They can even usher us into the presence of God. C.S. Lewis calls that spilled religion.
probably my favorite poem, and with this I close, time's up, is from Elizabeth Barrett Browning. The poem is Aurora Lee. Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. Amen. Thanks.